aliens are uh, another form of jurisdiction. It's not hard. Everyone thinks it's hard. It's not hard. It's really easy. I'm going to tell you how easy it is. There are four pieces of algebra here. They're easy to figure out. Let's get them up there just to see what kind of situation we're looking at. A, very intelligently, is alien. P and D, you know, are plaintiff and defendant. Let's start with a simple one. <coughs> alien versus alien. No federal diversity or alien is jurisdiction. Under the Verlinden case from the Supreme Court, there is simply no federal jurisdiction. An alien cannot sue an alien if that's the parties we're talking about under our equation. Let's talk about number two. An alien suing an alien and a citizen. No federal jurisdiction. There's no alienage. And the reason is because there's an alien on both sides and there's only one citizen on one side. But just follow the math here. Alien versus alien and citizen, no federal jurisdiction. It, it, it takes a mild parsing of 1332 to get here, but no jurisdiction. Caveat, of course, if we have a foreign state. But we'll get to that headache in a moment. OK, so there we go. Those are the two examples of no jurisdiction. Alien suing alien, and alien suing alien and citizen. All right? Now, let's uh, go to alien. And uh, let's blot out our friend from uh, Italy. We have alien suing citizen, or vice versa, citizen suing alien. Federal jurisdiction exists. Alienage jurisdiction. Alien when sued by a citizen have act or, or suing a citizen have access to federal court. So that's our third piece of algebra. Fourth piece of algebra. Alien <coughs> of and, and plaintiff of California suing alien and defendant of New York. And let me make a caveat right now. In the old days, there made a difference between France and Italy and different nations. Now, forget the, which nation they're from. An alien is an alien, whatever nation they're from. A, so now what we've got is we've got this situation. There is federal jurisdiction. Under 1332, this is a diversity suit with aliens as additional parties. This is not alien as jurisdiction. It's diversity jurisdiction. It's a diversity suit between P and D with aliens as additional parties. It wouldn't matter if we had this. It wouldn't matter if we had this. We have a diversity suit with aliens as different parties. That's diversity jurisdiction. That's not, uh, it's no more complicated than that. Those four pieces of algebra. Uh, what do you do with foreign states? Well, you know what I mean. Foreign states can sue in federal court or if sued can remove. So if it is a foreign state or, you know, those entities like my old client Qantas that are the equivalent of foreign states, you know, they're state-owned, and I forget what the test is. That creates federal jurisdiction under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. But uh, that's, a, that's really not alien its jurisdiction. Uh, let's, uh, let's ask ourselves one other question. What happens if uh, you have a dual citizen? A dual citizen. Well, at least in the Ninth Circuit under the Mutuelli's case, a dual citizen the court, the court has held that in the circumstance of a dual citizen, only the American nationality of the dual citizen applies. I don't know why that conclusion is the way it is. I think there's a split in authority. So if, it, if, you, if you have a feeling that this is the crazy ninth, read the Mutuelli's case. And it's side, there's one in the circuit that sort of goes a little bit sideways on that. But in any event, in the ninth circuit at least, and in a couple other circuits, only the American nationality of a dual citizen counts. And this was really a significant one. This is a great jurisdiction question where it was a dual citizen where the citizen, where it was a partnership. And the part, there were some partners who lived in France and some who lived in California. But there was, if you knocked out the France part of the partnership, there was diversity. Otherwise, as you saw from our algebra, there wouldn't have been. Didn't matter. Didn't matter in this circumstance. So take a look at Mutuelles or find a way around it, depending upon where you're coming from. All right, we got some last quick questions before we take our break on diversity. Uh, Equally fascinating, but we can do them quickly. What about fictitious defendants? Fictitious defendants are treated differently, whether it's, in my opinion, under whether it's a removal case or an original jurisdiction case. Let's get removal done right away. Under the removal statute, 
the fictitious defendant is not considered when you're doing your algebra. It's that simple. When the case is being removed, as of three years ago, case is being removed, you do not consider the citizenship of any DOE defendants if your state has that practice. All right, you just blot them out. It's also significant when they say, well, judge, we couldn't remove until that DOE defendant was removed. Wrong. They have, that DOE defendant is blotted out at the very beginning. They've got 30 days to remove. Now you might ask, well, what happens then if the DOE gets added later? Since they were blotted out, remember, for removal purposes, you need diversity to exist both at the time the action's commenced in state court and at the time of removal. But there's nothing that says you need it later. What if the DOE gets added later? Well, I'll leave that to you to decide. There's no circuit authority on that. But you could argue that since jurisdiction of the case is proper, the, the plaintiff ought to be allowed to add a DOE later because it doesn't defeat your jurisdiction. If you will, it's a congressional mandate of minimal diversity. You could argue the other direction. And you, if you argue the other direction, you'd look at 1447D, and you'd say, this is just a joinder under Rule 19. Forget the DOEs. They're being joined. If, I, if the joinder defeats diversity, I can remand. But we'll get there. Diversity. What about an original case? The dangerous practice, some courts say. I mean, you've got to search a long way to find the DOE practice dangerous. But the dangerous practice of DOE defendants in diversity cases. Well, the pretty long-standing rule is that DOE defendants <coughs> defeat diversity. They defeat diversity. Therefore, your normal rule would be since a DOE defendant possibly could defeat diversity since their citizenship isn't alleged, then you don't have original federal jurisdiction. Here's one where you ought to consider using Rule 21. If it's really a pro forma DOE and they didn't do it right, dismiss the case for jurisdiction. You're just going to get it refiled or you're going to kill them on the statute of limitations if they don't get relation back. Don't do it. One other complexity. Here's the other complexity. Rule 15 was amended two years ago, which is uh, news to some of us. And Rule 15 is the relation back rule. It says that when you're looking at the relation back rule, you look at the, you, if the state rule of relation back is more liberal than the federal rule, which is hard to imagine it's not, when adding a new party, you use, i.e. borrow, the state statute of limitations if it's a state statute of limitations that's governing the action. So that would be diversity cases almost always. It would also be federal question cases that borrow the state statute. All right? Well, in that circumstance, you might say, well, the DOE practice in many states is treated as a relation back rule. Therefore, we're bound to follow the DOE practice. It's therefore a substantive right. And therefore, I can't deprive the plaintiff of the opportunity, even in a diversity case. So you're going to have to struggle with that. I think it is genuinely a struggle. Uh, I mean, I wrote an article on it a few years ago, and I don't think it's been widely read, but it discusses the subject. Uh, in any event, I mean, you know, that was an interesting article, but not widely read. Do, do defendants, who knows where that happens. Let me give you one last point on fictitious defendants. There is no reason in the world not to allow them in a federal question case. They don't defeat anything. If the, if the state statute of limitations applies, you ought to not be striking DOE defendants in federal question cases. As odd as that is, there's no reason not to have them there. It's a proper technique to use with the amendments Rule 15. The only reason not to have them is if it defeats diversity. OK, the last couple ones quickly. Representative parties, if you're following the book, it's 2 colon 290.1, new statute, different than what we learned in law school. If you've got a typical representative action, there can be no manufacture of diversity by having that representative uh, have a citizenship that's diverse. Now, if it's an executor, an administrator, a guardian, a conservator, they take on the citizenship only of their represented party. So you look at the beneficiary, you look at uh, uh, et cetera. But let's, let's distinguish something. A trust suit is different. The real party and in interest in a trust, a suit brought by a trustee is the trustee, not the trust. And therefore, in a trustee suit under the Navarro case, you look at the citizenship of the trustee. The federal statute, which says you look at the citizenship of the represented party only, does not apply to trustee situations. There, you look at the citizenship of the trustee because it's the real party in interest. It is the proper plaintiff. It's not representing anybody. Uh, how about an insurance company? If you're one of those unfortunate jurisdictions that has a direct action, uh, if you were in that circumstance, I think there are only two of you, uh, the insurance company also, the insurance company can be named as a defendant. When they are named as a defendant, they take on the citizenship in addition to their, their insured. They don't, unlike the other situation where they only take on the represented party, here they get their own citizenship and the insured. So when you're doing your little charts, they'll only be on the defendant's side here. 
But when you're doing a little chart, ask yourself, put down their citizenship and the insured's citizenship if you have a direct action statute. By the way, a bad faith suit is not a direct action suit. It's not. That's not a direct action in the meaning of the statute. That is simply a suit against an insurance company. It's not that weird statutory creation of when you really mean, mean to sue the insured, you can sue the insurer. All right? Lastly, in our last two and a half minutes before the break, don't look happy about this break, what happens if citizenship changes in the fluidity of federal cases and in the length of some of them? Uh, I have just finished a trial of a case that was filed in 1984. It went to the Supreme Court and back. I represent a magazine. It's been a very complicated trial, but it's been 10 years of litigation. A lot of people have moved, uh, but the rule is clear. You look at snapshot at the time the action's commenced, and if it's removal, at also at the time it's removed. Does jurisdiction exist? The normal rule is if a party changes their citizenship, it makes no difference on your jurisdiction. All right, Freeport McMoran in a two-page per curiam decision of the court that many people ignored, but you are not going to, paragraph 2 colon 373, uh, and this citation is 111 Supreme Court, 858. It's, it emphasizes that rule. However, let's leave you with this caveat. That rule applies when the party themselves moves or that party is substituted in for somebody else, so that, although there's a change in their name. Let's distinguish that from when a new party comes into the case. Brand new party. Not, they're not coming in by assignment or movement. They're a brand new party. Now you've got to have diversity, in my opinion, with the possible exception of Doe defendants, only because of that statute. All right. Now, every study that's ever been done says that the average attention span of the adult is about seven minutes. We've been going a lot longer than that, We've got a 15-minute break, and we're coming back to the glory and inglory of federal removal. Well, when we left off, we were making that great transition to removal jurisdiction, the back door of uh, federal jurisdiction. Generally, if an action could have been brought originally in federal court, removal is available. The general rule is that if the action could have been brought originally in federal court, the action is removable. There are, of course, some exceptions to this rule if uh, some claims are statutory non-removable, such as an FELA case. That would not be removable uh, because the statute says it's the plaintiff gets their original choice of forum. So that would be federal officer removal would be an example where a statute allows removal even though the case may or may not have been bringable originally in federal court. There may be no federal jurisdiction. Uh, the, let's, however, weave into where we left off with diversity and talk about removal premised on diversity. Uh, there are some procedural rules that I want to leave for a little bit later discussion about timing of removal and when the 30 days runs. But I do want to talk about this. The same general rules for analyzing diversity apply on removal. Remembering the only principal difference is there has to be diversity both at the time of commencement and the time of removal, which may be a different more than 30 days in some circumstances. But as a general rule, you use your same algebraic equation. There's one rule which is applied more frequently, however, in the removal context in diversity than original, and that is what's known as the fraudulent joinder doctrine. Now, this isn't what it sounds like. It doesn't mean that the plaintiff named a defendant with fraudulent intent. It means that when doing your algebra, for removal purposes, you can blot out and not consider the citizenship of defendants who are named against whom there is no possible bona fide claim. And I mean just that. There is no possible claim, and the absence of that claim appears on the face of the complaint. In other words, uh, let me give you an example. I represent a newspaper. Let's suppose it's, uh, which is, say, principal place of business in Nevada. Let's assume for the moment that it's also uh, incorporated in Nevada. But it does some business in California. They get sued in California. It turns out, being on the border, that their printing company is incorporated. The company that prints the, the newspaper is incorporated in California. Wagstaff of California suing Nevada newspaper and California, and I add as a defendant, the California printing company on the theory that they printed it, they're responsible for it. 
The law is absolutely clear. There is no question whatsoever in California and Nevada that that is an improperly named defendant. They are not properly named in a libel suit just because they printed it, absent some allegation of awareness or participation. Therefore, the Nevada company can remove that to federal court even though the algebraic equation doesn't seem right because you blot out the defendant who is fraudulently joined. You blot them out. All right, now in a, remember, in this process, it says, does not mean a weak claim. It does not mean a not very good claim. It means a claim that has no possible bona fides on the face of the complaint. So if they remove and they say, hey, this isn't a very good claim, even if it's subject to 12B6, that's probably not enough. It's got to be that it fails the smell test on initial odor, meaning under clear-cut law, there is no possible claim. If you love baseball and jurisdiction, as I do, then you must read the, the Pete Rose versus Bart Giamatti case because it is a remarkable case because it combines two of the most important things in life, removal jurisdiction and baseball. <laughs> well, to some of us. In that case, Pete Rose sues. You might remember Pete Rose. He's a mildly historic figure out of Cincinnati who was uh, the, the Major League Baseball commissioner, was suspending him, uh, even though he's the manager of the Cincinnati Red Leg Ball Club because he was uh, allegedly gambling. And he sued in Ohio State Court. This was no dumb person or lawyer. Sued in a local Ohio State Court. And in that Ohio State Court, he added his Giamatti was a resident domiciliary of New York. He added his defendants, the Cincinnati Reds Ball Club and Major League Baseball. So let's do our algebra before we get to fraudulent joinder. The algebra is simple. Rose of, of Ohio sues Giamatti of New York, complete diversity, but Additional defendants, Cincinnati Red Legs, Unincorporated Association, every member, Ohio, Ohio, Ohio. In addition, Major League Baseball, Unincorporated Association, there are a couple of teams in Ohio. Not the best teams, but they're in Ohio. <laughs> we now have Ohio on both sides. We have no complete diversity. The algebraic equation fails. However, I must say, not quite right away, Pete Rose brings a, seeks a TRO. It's granted. The defendants, seek a, 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 all within the 30-day period, seek to have it reviewed by uh, uh, extraordinary writ, denied. Still within the 30 days, they remove to federal court and argue that Major League Baseball and Cincinnati Red Legs are fraudulently joined. First argument, did they waive their right of removal by opposing a TRO? No. No waiver of the right to remove. The waiver to, of the right to remove has to be affirmative. You have to affirmatively seek some relief in the state court merely defending against the TRO, and according to this court at least, seeking an extraordinary writ is not enough. So that's, that's one thing. By the way, make a note to yourself, when you're thinking about ways that there can be remand, think about waiver. Contractual waivers of the right to remove are a very common ground for remand. But we'll look at that in a moment. So here's, the, here's where all the money's at, is Major League Baseball and the Cincinnati Red Leagues, are they fraudulently joined? The district court, in a published opinion, held yes. His real beef, his only beef, the real collision of interest, according to the court, was only between Giamatti and, the, and Pete Rose. The theory at that time, I think may not hold up anymore, is that the commissioner has all inclusive powers. I think maybe we get a different decision today, given subsequent developments. But in any event, all inclusive powers, Major League Baseball couldn't control it. Cincinnati Red Legs couldn't control it. They're fraudulently joined as a matter of law. We have complete diversity. Case stays in federal court. And then settles <coughs> quickly. Uh, so that's our fraudulent joinder concept. And keep that in mind. Uh, one other concept, the $50,000 amount in controversy. We know what that means in an original action. It means if there's any possible claim, if there's any possible claim that could exceed $50,000, even if it doesn't ultimately exceed $50,000, that's enough for federal jurisdiction. The burden of proving jurisdiction is on the party asserting it. Therefore, in an original action, the plaintiff has the burden of proof. In a removed action, the defendant has the burden of proof. I must tell you, having been in this situation a few times, it's a very odd situation. We're on removal. When I'm representing the defendant, I'm arguing to the court that the claim has a value in excess of $50,000, and the plaintiff is arguing, no, 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 it's less than $50,000. <laughs> It's an odd sort of shifting of burdens. 
But that's exactly what has to happen. If the plaintiff, you look, the snapshot is the time of removal. Is there $50,000 possible in controversy? Possible. And you give all, I think you give all intentions in favor of there being a possibility of $50,000, unless you can say as a matter of law, there's no way they can, they can score more than $50,000. All right? So you might say, well, what happens if the plaintiff then says voluntarily, well, OK, I'm only seeking $49,900? Not enough. That is the wonderful old 1938 case from St. Paul versus Mercury Insurance, which says you cannot unilaterally strip the court of jurisdiction by saying less than the jurisdictional amount. All right? So that's, that's, that's diversity. Let's get to where some more of the actions at before procedure. And that is federal question removal. What's our general rule again? A case may not be removed on the basis of a federal defense. Federal jurisdiction exists only if, here's the bad penny, if federal jurisdiction appears on the face of a well-pleaded complaint. You know what that means. What that means is, is that you, just as in the Merrill Dow case, you ask yourself, looking at the four corners of the complaint, is there a federal claim in there? Is it asserted? Not could it be asserted, is it asserted? Which brings us to a very important and often uh, overlooked rule, which is that the plaintiff is the master of their claim. If they want to pitch their state court complaint on state law grounds, they're free to do so. The defendant ordinarily cannot recast the complaint on federal grounds and say they could have had a federal civil rights claim, and these facts give rise to a federal civil rights claim, and therefore it's a federal civil rights claim. We don't have the quack like a duck rule. The plaintiff is the master of their com complaint in state court, and in fact, frequently deliberately ignore the federal claims to stay out of your courtrooms. And therefore, they're free to do that, generally speaking. The defendant cannot recast it. However, there's one large and difficult exception to this rule, and you know where I'm going, I hope. This is known as the artful pleading doctrine, what Judge Tashima refers to as the artless pleading doctrine. Let's make sure we understand it and keep in mind, in your back of your mind, the defensive preemption rule. All right, just put that aside and we're going to get to it. The plaintiff cannot defeat federal removal jurisdiction of a federal claim by disguising or artfully pleading it as a state law claim. And here's the kicker. If the only claim is a federal one, the only federal, the only claim that can be stated on these facts is necessarily a federal claim. The court recharacterizes that artfully pled state law complaint and puts the correct label on it, which is it is necessarily a federal claim. Remember, that means that there is no state law claim available here under, the, under, under those facts or uh, that the claim which they're labeling as a state law claim is necessarily federal, giving rise to removal of the whole action. All right. So uh, if the claim is necessarily federal, there can be removal. And you know what it is? This is known as the complete preemption doctrine. Uh, I think an easier term to remember it by is the displacing preemption doctrine. Federal law displaces state law. So far, we're exactly on par with defensive preemption, aren't we? Like the cigarette labeling law. That's fact, that's requirement number one. Here's the distinction. And if you get this distinction, you will be light years ahead of most people who understand or think they do federal jurisdiction. There is displacement of state law claims, fair enough. And it is replaced with a federal claim or the possibility of a federal claim. In other words, there is a private right of action under the displacing federal statute. The cigarette labeling law is defensive. You know why? Because it, while it blots out, to use the Seventh Circuit's language, it blots out the state law claims, there is no replacement federal claim. There's no federal claim for violation of the federal warning on a cigarette uh, carton. So there would be no, that would be defensive preemption, no federal claim, no removal jurisdiction. So what, what happens? What do you do in that circumstance? What some judges say is, well, you know, I've got the case in removal, and I know I don't have any jurisdiction, but this is preempted, so I order it dismissed. Wrong. You don't dismiss that claim, even though you, that's really what has to happen. You remand to the state court with whatever lingo you want to convince them to dismiss it. 
the, you have no jurisdiction to dismiss it. You have no federal jurisdiction. You don't dismiss it, even though that may be required under federal law. There's no federal claim giving you the base of the tree. Well, that's hard to swallow, but that's exactly what you're supposed to do. If, on the other hand, we have displacing preemption plus the claim, we now have federal removal jurisdiction. Uh, so let's figure out the two principal areas where this comes up. And there are a couple others, but we're not going to talk about them because these are the principal ones. The overwhelming percentage of displacing preemption cases involve the LMRA, labor cases, sec Section uh, 301 cases under collective bargaining agreements, and ERISA claims. These are the here are the two red flags you look for. Is there a union employee, particularly as a plaintiff? It's a good indication it might be a 301 case. It really is connected in some way to the collective bargaining agreement. For, one of, for our initials, we'll call it the CBA, collective bargaining agreement. Second, is there some employee benefit plan somehow involved or affected by this case? If that's the case, you might then have preemption in one of our situations. Now. Uh, if we do have that, then the federal court recharacterizes the claim as a federal claim and allows removal. And all the normal rules of removal apply. Uh, there's no exception to that, that doctrine. I want to emphasize two points, though, before we look at labor law and ERISA law. First, there is no requirement that the federal remedy be as effective or as broad as the state remedy. In fact, that's probably why the defendant's removing, because labor law has a shorter statute of limitations, for example, six months under 301. ERISA doesn't have as broad remedies as the state wrongful discharge claim, for example. And in those circumstances, it doesn't have to be the same. In fact, there's some case law that says you don't even have to have a good federal claim at all. As one court said, the court, the defendant is free to tow the ship into the federal harbor only to sink it once it's there. They're free to do that because there is federal jurisdiction, but there's no right to go forward with that case for whatever reasons. Uh, and second of all, again, remember, if federal does, law does not create the claim for relief, there, generally speaking, is no preemption, uh, complete preemption for purposes of removal. We simply have a state court case that's preempted. All right. Now, uh, let's take a look uh, at these. But before we get looking at them, let me say this. And I've used this example in other areas, but this is as good an area as there is. Someone said to me last time I got done with ERISA and labor law preemption that this is like having a root canal, learning about these two areas of preemption. So for the next few minutes, think of me as the uh, Novocaine of your life in understanding these doctrines. Because I recognize one important thing that, uh, as Eliot said, it, at this time of day, it's easy to be like a patient etherized upon a table. I understand that. So try and bear with this Prufrockian uh, experience, recognizing that distinguishing between what is preempted and what is not preempted is often like guessing which bird will jump off the fence first. It's not always easy to do, but let's see if we can do it together right now. Let's start with labor law preemption. Labor law preemption. An LMRA suit under Section 301, if it was brought in the proper cast, the plaintiff, the union employee, is suing in some way under the collective bargaining agreement or related to it and says, uh, I've got a federal claim here. You violated the collective bargaining agreement uh, employer, and therefore I'm suing. Proper federal jurisdiction. In fact, not only is there complete preemption, displacement of state law, blotting out all state law claims that arise here under this test, but in addition, replaces it with a 301 claim. May not be a good one, might be barred by the statute of limitations, might not have very good remedies or any, but it's there. So how do we figure it out? Well, the Supreme Court has told us. Does the resolution of the claim require construction or reference to the collective bargaining agreement? In order to decide this, remember how it's phrased. Plaintiff goes into state court and sues for breach of contract. Well, that's a state law claim. It doesn't mention the labor agreement anywhere. It's a state law claim. However, if it's a union employee, and in order to decide this case, which we're clearly going to have to if it's a wrongful discharge case, we've got to look at the terms and conditions of employment as set forth in the CBA. 
it's going to require some resolution or construction of a CBA term. Therefore, you blot out that state law claim and replace it with a federal 301 claim. Removal is, a, is appropriate. Now, let me give you one important thing. This is concurrent jurisdiction. So if they, do, if they don't remove within the procedures, don't feel badly. Remand it to state court and let the 301 case go forward in state court. Nothing wrong with that. It's concurrent jurisdiction. And by and large, most ERISA cases, except the breach of fiduciary duty cases, are concurrent jurisdiction. So don't feel badly if you send this back to state court. The plaintiff, excuse me, the defendant must still comply with the removal procedure rules. No, just, just because it's preemption doesn't mean it has to be in federal court here. It means that the federal claim can be decided by a state court judge. It's like a civil rights claim, for goodness sake. You can have removal of a federal civil rights claim, but a state court judge can decide that. Nothing exclusive jurisdiction about that. Uh, so we ask ourselves, how do you apply this? Well, let's just take ourselves through some of them. I'll go up a little bit here. Breach of contract. If it's a breach of contract, pretty good idea that that contractual remedy derives in some way from the collective bargaining agreement. Or even if it's not under the collective bargaining agreement, in order to decide that so-called contract that they're alleging, they might allege a separate agreement. In order to decide that, you may well need, if it's someone who's covered by the CBA, you probably will need to look at the CBA to determine it. Let me give you a good rule of thumb. And like all rules of thumb, it should be taken as such. Someone once said, never walk across a river simply because the average depth is four feet. I feel the same way about rules of thumb. However, let's look at this rule of thumb. Here's a good rule of thumb as to whether it's related. If it was going to be a jury trial, which it was not going to be, but if it was going to be a jury trial, perhaps, would there be a jury instruction where at the bottom where they list their cases that they might be able to cite the CBA as giving some support to it? You know what I mean? Yeah, they submit proposed jury instructions. At the bottom, they give their authority for it. Is the CBA going to be authority for any law in the case? That's one good rule of thumb. Another good rule of thumb, in addition to it, is ask yourself in making any rules on ad ru rulings on admissibility of evidence, will you be looking at the CBA in any way? Is the CBA in any way relevant to any determinations you're going to have to make as a judge? You get that gut feeling in a breach of contract suit and in a wrongful discharge suit, if it's a union employee, almost always there's going to be preemption. Now you may say, does well, that preempt the whole case? It preempts every claim for relief that is necessarily federal. There may be some other claims that are supplemental, which are not preempted. But that does not mean the case can't be removed. It can be, because you've got a single federal claim and supplemental claims. But you have a federal claim. How about defamation? Here's a case that I had just a few years ago. I represented the plaintiff in a sexual uh, harassment case, good sexual harassment case. We're at deposition. I had an instruction with my client. We're in state court. No removal. It's just sexual harassment. We're going to get down here in a moment. Nothing about that. Just assault and battery. It's just good old independent state law claim. I said to her at deposition, you know, if I say I need to go to the bathroom, that means I want to talk to you about the question that's pending. All right? So that's a pretty good rule. I mean, some of us have had this rule. I think it's proper. You can pr rule 11 me if you like, rule 37 if you like, but I did it. That's my rule. Question. A question that almost no plaintiff can resist. Do you contend, the question's asked, deposition, about 4.30 like now, do you contend that you were defamed during the grievance process. I am kicking. I'm set. First thing I say is, I need to go to the bathroom. She says, I'll answer the question first. It's not the rule. <laughs> now I'm kicking her to the table. I need to go to the bathroom. She says, I'm answering the question first. The answer is, yes, they defame me at every step of the grievance process. Within about uh, an hour, we got a notice of removal to federal court because they claim we didn't know from the pleadings this was a federal preemption labor law case, but it was a defamation case that arose in connection with the grievance process. Therefore, blots out the state law claim. Therefore, it is a federal claim. Therefore, removal. You know, I'm in federal court. Motion to remand denied. My foot hurts still, but the point is that that is because the defamation arose in connection with the grievance process. The other kind of defamation claim that would probably be preempted is if the defamation is, a, is part of a communication required by the CBA, some sort of termination letter, something like that. 
If it, because then in order to understand the context of the defamation, what is reasonable, unreasonable, and malice or whatever it is, you may have to turn to the collective bargaining agreement. On the other hand, put this defamation down here under claims not preempted if it's really an independent libel that's not connected with the grievance process or part of a communication. However, since this is usually a parasitic tort to other claims, there will probably be something that's preempted and it'll be in federal court. Infliction of emotional stress, probably preempted because in order to determine what is outrageous or sufficiently unreasonable conduct, you look at the terms and conditions of employment set forth in the CBA. Case law is pretty, pretty clear there. Fraud claim, probably preempted. It depends. You've got circuits sort of flow in different directions here, <coughs> like a bad river. But the fact is that probably, in my opinion, generally preempted because the fraud is going to, I think, have certain similar incidents to infliction of emotional stress. In order to determine the nature of the communication, how you're defrauded, it probably, we may have to look at the CBA. It might be the other side of the line. Let's go to the other side of the line. It's more fun. Assault and battery. Assault and battery. Assault and battery, according to the Supreme Court, is very clearly an independent right. You don't have to make reference to the CBA to know that you are free from assault and battery on the job. Now, the Ninth Circuit in Galvez versus Kuhn and Materials had a great case in which, kind of a weird case, but that, that's the Ninth Circuit, in which an employee in her collective bargaining agreement was working the conveyor belt late at night, a woman employee. The male employee supervisor, who doesn't like her, the allegation goes, deliberately speeds up the conveyor belt in sort of what, the, what I think Judge Nelson in a footnote said, reminiscent of Charlie Chaplin in modern times. I am not nearly so eclectic. Think of it more like Lucy and, and uh, Ethel with the candy going down the conveyor belt. In any event, the box hits her. Plaintiff's lawyer is smart and alleges assault and battery, nothing else. Assault and battery. They pitched their claim properly. That is independent of the collective bargaining agreement. That claim the court held was not preempted. Just an assault and battery claim. Good plaintiff's lawyers get clever. Discrimination suits. Discrimination suits in almost all circuits are not going to be preempted because that's a right independent of the collective bargaining agreement. To put it a different way, and I like this terminology, although the Supreme Court and Caterpillar, or, excuse me, and Lingle suggested it's not the only terminology. Ask yourself this. Remember what happens to the union employee. They are being bargained for collectively on, you know, on, their, own, on their behalves. Could the union bargain away the right to be free from discrimination? The answer is no. It's, not, it's a non-negotiable right. You know, whistleblowing statutes under state law. The lingual case is your right to not be fired for reporting workers' compensation uh, abuses. Those are independent of the collective bargaining agreement. And note this, this is important. Simply because the collective bargaining agreement might have a parallel provision that parallel state law, our employees will not discriminate, does not mean that it's preempted. In fact, that parallel provision is unnecessary to resolve the state law claim. It's unnecessary. So merely because it's parallel does not mean it changes your act of non-preemption. You remand that case. So independent public policy. Lastly, if the case involves non-management employee, look at the Caterpillar case, a non-management employee who's not covered by the CBA, we don't have any trouble with that. That's not going to be, you don't have to make reference to CBA. They're not covered by the CBA. There won't be preemption. Okay? So that takes us through uh, labor law preemption. Now let's go, if you will, with me and do ERISA preemption. Now ERISA preemption has an another little chart that I'm going to make reference to. When they told me I was doing an afternoon speech, I said more visual aids. <coughs> uh, now this happens a lot. ERISA preemption is the largest growing field of cases removed to federal court in the last five years. So there's a reason to know this as I see it. Here's the basic rule. I'm going to the overhead projector now. ERISA preemption. Here's the test. Does, a, does the state law, which is at issue, or the claim, the state law claim, relate to an employee benefit plan? Does it relate to an employee benefit plan? That's our principal question we ask ourselves. This test is even broader than the labor law preemption, meaning because relate to is interpreted not just as sort of connected with and requires construction, but does it relate in any way to, which is, you can see is broader than requires some construction or reference to. There's three questions you ask yourself. 
three basic questions. If you like to think of this as a vegematic, with each crank of the vegematic, each of these elements is a requirement. All three have to be satisfied uh, or answered in the proper way before that case is properly removable on preemption grounds. Remember, preemption blots out the state law claims. Some cleverly, artfully pled state law claim for wrongful discharge uh, or for more commonly, someone's being suing the, their employer or their insurance company for not paying benefits. And by the way, there's no amount of controversy here. It could be a $500 failure to pay. And that $500 could drag the whole case to federal court. You might be able to remand some of it in a moment, but it could drag, it gets it all there properly. You don't remove parts of cases. You can remand parts of cases, but you don't remove parts of cases. Question number one, is there an employee benefit plan covered by the statute? Now, if this is the question in your case, listen to me for the next few minutes, but trust me, this is as close to a productive idea for a migraine headache as any of the areas under ERISA. Because whether there's a plan or not, if, if, you get, if there's a question on this, it means it's a complicated issue. Uh, let's figure out what it means generally. According to one court, they said this field, particularly this question, luxuriates in riotous uncertainty. That's a way of describing that it's hard. I don't think it has to be that hard. I don't think it has to be that hard. Only state law claims or laws that relate to an employee benefit plan covered by the statute are preempted. So there has to be a plan. There has to either be a welfare plan, health, disability, life insurance, severance, et cetera, or there has to be a pension plan, some plan that uh, somehow involves retirement income or deferment of income. So there's either a welfare plan or a pension plan. Uh, now, ERISA gives a very broad definition to the word plan. It, uh, it doesn't mean that there's anything in writing. It doesn't mean that they've sat down with an ERISA lawyer and figured it out. Uh, there has to be more than one person in the plan, but put, uh, originally, eventually you can get down to one, but there has to be more than one person. The plan is not uh, one, but beyond that, it's any, pretty much any company benefit grouping is going to be pretty close to a plan. Uh, most private sector plans, even if they're administered by insurance companies, will be ERISA plans. Sometimes they'll be administered by themselves, but there will be ERISA plans. Well, what kind of things are not going to be plans and what will be? Well, I keep an eye on this one. The, uh, the United States Supreme Court in uh, Fort Halifax versus Coyne uh, says that law, they had a one-time, a stat state statute required a one-time payment of a severance to discharge employees. So that was mandated by state law. The Supreme Court held that one time only, non-administered, non-controlled kind of situation is not a plan. Is not a plan. And therefore, the Supreme Court held ERISA doesn't really kick in here. When would there not be a plan? The, there would not be a plan if the employer uh, doesn't make premium contributions. And the uh, Participation is completely voluntary. These are all ands, by the way. Completely voluntary. In other words, you, you go there, you don't have to be part of it. They don't contribute, you don't have to be part of it. The employer doesn't endorse the plan. Simp the employer simply allows the insurer to come in and use their facilities, and they may get paid a small fee for dealing with payroll deductions, but the, the employer is completely out of it, and there's no employer profit. You add all those things together, which is a pretty rare situation, you may have no plan. Take a look at 2 colon 772.2. Uh, a plan, however, usually is going to have not all of those elements together. The employer usually will be involved in some fashion. So that brings us really to question number two. Question number one, you need more help than we can give you in these few minutes. But let's go to question number two, because that's where all the action's at. Does the state law or the claim relate to a covered plan? And remember what the effect of preemption is here, by the way, in ERISA. May limited damages, may be no emotional stress, no punitive damages. Uh, the judicial review, as you know from, uh, the case escapes me now, but the judicial review may be a de, a de novo or abuse of discretion, depending upon the circumstances. Uh, there, uh, there may be uh, not only limited damages, but there may be certain circumstances where there's no damage at all. And there may be circumstances where although ERISA preempts, ERISA provides no remedy, such as estoppel. 
ERISA, it may be a estoppel may require there be ERISA preemption. We'll look at it in a moment, but there may be no ability to sue successfully under ERISA on an estoppel theory, which is, you know, you told me when I told you my wife was, had a difficult pregnancy that uh, I was not going to be, that I would be covered in the plan. And then, they, then it turns out the plan's terms don't cover you. Well, you'd say, well, that's estoppel, classic state law doctrine. That claim probably, although some circuits say no, probably gets removed to federal court. Because if it's anything, it's an ERISA claim. It clearly relates to plan. On the other hand, there's no real serious ERISA remedy in those circumstances. That's a tough situation, isn't it? But that appears to be where the case law is going on that area. Some, some circuits are more open to, to those kind of claims. What does it mean to relate to? Connection to or reference to? Either one. Let me give you some sort of guidelines in your own mind to, to, to answer here. These are, not, these are independent sort of factors to consider. <coughs> Ask yourself, does the suit or the claim negate a specific ERISA provision? Does it negate an ERISA provision? In other words, let's suppose you've got an anti-subrogation state statute, but you've got a subrogation provision, or, an an or, or let's suppose you've got a mandatory subrogation provision, and you've got an anti-subrogation provision in the ERISA plan. Well, that would be negating a pre precise provision. The whole point of allowing preemption is we want uniform law in this important area. Ironically, it was designed, I think, to expand the rights of employees, but many employers now love the ERISA statute for the limitations we've indicated. Uh, second, does it in any way affect the administration of the plan? That's another thing to consider. Is there a negative economic impact on the plan, to say it a different way? Or is there any impact at all on the plan? If the answer to those questions are yes, you're getting real close to relates to. Let's come up with a simple example. That's Metropolitan Life Insurance versus Taylor, also in the materials. Plaintiff sues the insurer in state court for bad faith handling of claims under uh, what would be an ERISA-covered plan. State law claim. Since ERISA provides a federal claim here for claims handling, complete preemption, Metropolitan Life says removal is proper. No question about it. Uh, any claim that the employer wrongfully denied employment benefits is going to be covered. Now, here's one the Supreme Court entered into a few years ago, the Ingersoll Rand case. It seems like Justice O'Connor gets assigned every ERISA claim. I don't think that's a good assignment. I mean, can you imagine when the ERISA case gets search granted, they say, you're going to write this one? I mean, it's, you talk about headaches. That's, you know, the, the K.O. Pectate assignment. It's an awful assignment. So you know what happens is? You, she gets, but she writes them beautifully and clearly. I, th I really believe this. Ingersoll Rand versus McClendon. You have, in that case, a plaintiff who sues the employer. There's a plan, so we're going to pass step number one. Sues the employer and says, you know what? You wrongfully terminated me at the nine-year, ten-month because uh, I was going to get vested in my benefits at that point. Plaintiff who doesn't want to be in federal court, it's in Texas, says, forget it and says, I don't want any remedies for my lost pension. I just want my emotional stress and other things for wrongful discharge. But the public policy that was violated to give me my state wrongful discharge claim is the being fired because of the ERISA plan. The Texas Supreme Court held no preemption. I published an article a few years ago in the legal newspaper. Judge Caulfield probably read it. And it said the following, to my wife's great chagrin and fear. I will buy, Supreme Court granted cert. After cert was granted, I wrote an article that said, I will buy dinner for any reader of this article if the Supreme Court does not reverse. Well, that's a pretty grandiose uh, situation. <laughs> Mercifully, the Supreme Court reversed nine to nothing and held, of course, that relates to the plan. The whole premise of the lawsuit involves the vesting provisions of the plan. You can't get around it by not seeking, quote, plan remedies, or everybody could get around an ERISA plan. The court said that it, had, it not only makes reference, it has a connection. The court added, in a beautiful opinion by Justice O'Connor, fortunately, added that in addition, this is expressly preempted because there is a federal ERISA claim for being, denied your, being fired for being denied your benefits. So you may say to yourself, that seems like number two is real broad. Seems like almost everything would be involved. And the answer is no. Don't catch preemption fever. In other words, there are situations in which there will be no ERISA preemption. If the relationship to ERISA is tenuous,
quoting the cases. A wrongful discharge case in which the plaintiff is not saying I was discharged because of my pension benefits, but when asked the question, in addition to the damages that you're suffering, are you also claiming that your pension, which would have grown if you'd stayed here, is now smaller? Well, yeah, of course. That's, that's logic. If I'd stayed here longer, my pension would have grown bigger. The Ninth Circuit and most other circuits have held that that is not going to re relate to the ERISA plan because it's, the relation to ERISA there is tenuous. It's just a parasitic damage. You need to go to the ERISA plan to calculate the damage, but it has no impact on the ERISA plan. It's a tenuous relationship. It's not enough. And I think that makes sense. Uh, how about a non-ERISA entity suing the ERISA plan uh, fiduciary for run-of-the-mill state law torts? I'll give you an example. The accountant sues the plan. You're not paying me. Or, they sue, or, the, or the plan sues the accountant and says you committed malpractice. Or the lawyer. The courts have held that's, quote, a run-of-the-mill state law tort. And it does not relate in the way required to the covered plan. So you're not going to have that kind of situation. So I wouldn't necessarily assume that just because there's a plan involved that you automatically have ERISA preemption. And I would take a look at some of the cases that are set forth. Let's go to question number three. This is, uh, fortunately, doesn't come up that much. But when it does, it's like question number one. OK, we've got a plan. The Vegematic crank is, is cranking. We've got a plan. It relates to the plan. Now the third question is for preemption. Does the state law nevertheless fall within the savings clause? The savings clause. Now this seems complicated, but just bear with me for a minute and a half. ERISA does not preempt state, law claim, state laws or claims that regulating insurance, banking, or security. It saves those laws. But don't jump to the, any conclusions here. If the law is specifically directed to the insurance industry, such as a requirement that the company keep reserves, then that law might be subject to the savings clause. That is, no preemption because it's saved from preemption. The state law can continue to enforce those state laws. Uh, and essentially, you ask yourself, is this really a law of general applicability, or is it a law that's aimed directly at that industry? If it's a law of general applicability, a rule that interprets and contracts against you know, the party who drafted them. I happen to believe, although there's some cases to the contrary, that that is a law of general applicability. That's not subject to savings law. You will use ERISA law there, not a state law. Uh, but uh, there is some dispute as to that. 